Hey everyone, uh, I'm Duke Kellick. I'm the Earl Marshal of the Middle Kingdom. Uh, we're going to be going over the latest edition of the Midrealm Marshal's Handbook, or Armored Marshal's Handbook. Uh, Society just released a new edition, uh, so that meant we needed to review the changes that the Society had put out um, and, and implement them into ours. Uh, the Midrealm can have tighter rules than the Society, but we can't have looser rules. So one of the changes uh, Society said is um, uh, no spears can be over nine feet long. So the mid realm, uh, we had a rule saying you could be up to twelve feet. That was automatically we can't go any lo any uh, longer than nine feet, but we could go shorter. We could say we wanted to have seven feet, which we're not going to do. But that's an example of where we could be tighter instead of uh, we can't be any looser. Um, so with that said, uh, the way this is going to work, um, I'm going to go over the most recent changes from the the mid realm and the society level. Then we'll talk about some other changes that we've had recently, and then we will go over the different areas of, of marshalling that I think are, are most important. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can feel free to, to ask as we, we go through here. Uh, anybody have any questions right from the beginning? All right, I like that. Uh, so here are the, the major mid-realm changes, uh, or maybe I should start with the society changes and then we'll go to the mid-realm ones. So we'll go wide and then narrow. Uh, society level changes that are applicable to the Middle Kingdom so the uh, society changed the groin protection rule. Uh, they added clarification that says uh, testicles must be protected to a standard equivalent to that provided by an athletic cup. Uh, so the that means um, just that. If you have testicles, they have to be covered. So what we're going to do in the Middle Kingdom uh, is we are going to, oh, we have wording on this and I don't have that in front of me. We're, we're not going to, I'm not going to come up and say, um, are you wearing a cup? Um, we are going to, uh, I think this is important, so I want to actually get the uh, the wording that we used. Um, I thought it was was really good. Um, whew. So this recording is already off to a, a great start with me having to look something up right away. Um, but I think this is a, an important um, one. We uh, are trying to standardize how we want to do inspections too, so this would be a good reminder of that as well. So one moment. Yeah, look, if I may. Yeah. We we had a recent incident at a fight practice, uh rapier fight practice, where you know, we have a, a generic, are you wearing all the appropriate protective equipment to make it generic and diverse? So we're not asking people, are you wearing a cup or not? And the, the person responded, yes. And then they went to start sparring. And he's like, oh, by the way, don't throw below my waist. I don't have a cup on. So I know we have to dance that line, but right. we may we may need to like be a little more clear with some people if we're not sure about them. Sure. Uh the the uh prescribed language that we have in the, the handbook is um, are you satisfied with your groin protection? So we're letting people know you uh should understand that you need to have groin protection if you you need to um we're not going to then say hey what are you wearing um or we're not we will absolutely never ever ask hey can you show me that's a uh, hundred percent inappropriate um so we we are trying to do visual inspections for armor just not the groin um so if you uh, what i mean by a visual inspection is um it's an acceptable if, if somebody's wearing uh like a 14th century kit um where all the armor is exposed you might be able to to look at somebody uh, and say, okay, they're wearing elbows that are good. I can see that they have good kidney protection. I can see that they have good knee protection. Um, so I don't need to to touch them. But if somebody is having armor that's more hidden, uh, I might need to say, okay, I'm going to, uh, can I check your kidneys? And just like people know what you're going to do as we go through it. Um, so it's not just uh, a pat down or uh, it should be just kind of um, in today's environment, we really should be asking for consent before we put hands on people. Uh, and we have to check helmets. So we do have to touch them. We're going to have to touch the helmet. We're going to say, okay, I need to check your helmet. Can you please lean in for me? And then, you know, you let somebody know what you're doing. And then uh, I think that'll make for a better environment. Um, so that was the, the first rule change. Um, and I think that was a pretty big one. Uh, the society removed the separate breast cup rule. So before there was a rule saying that you can't have that. Uh, now there's, they're saying that you, that you may, um, they have a rule change on single-handed weapons for thrusting tips. Uh, previously, the requirement was uh, three quarters of an inch of, of uh, progressive give. 
uh, and they've removed that. They've changed that to uh, half an inch thickness. Um, and they've said that that's been used in Trimeris for 10 years with no issues. So half an inch is really, it's going to be more uh, that you have it than trying to make sure that you have half an inch of progressive give because you're only going to have half an inch. So as long as it's not rock, rock hard, um, we have been given the instructions that that's good. Um, we have already mentioned that society changed maximum spear length from 12 feet to nine feet. Uh, so, but that's where we're going. I think in all my time, I think I've seen one 12 foot spear uh, and that was last summer. Um, maybe there might've been a couple in some barren wars in years past, but they weren't um, terribly common. Uh, so now they're not gonna be uh, anywhere. So those were the, the major society ones and then some mid realm ones that came down. Uh, as a note, um, right now I'm working with the Earl Marshals of the East and Athelmark to try to come up with a, a standard uh, definition of how to get engagement with with uh, a combatant. Um, we were looking at the the three kingdoms and how we have defined engagement, and they're all a little bit off. Um, they don't uh, quite agree with each other, uh, and so sometimes we have um, some friction between our kingdoms at, at big events like Penzig, and I think it comes from this where. Um, we're not, it's not that anybody's cheating. It's just that they're what they've been trained and how they understand engagement to work is a little bit different. So, you know, the mid room has one standard, the East has a different and they don't quite line up. So it leads to just some friction. So that's something that um, is not included in the current handbook. We wanted to get the, the handbook out uh, as with as much information as we can, um, knowing that we might have to go back and revise that a little bit here in, in a month or two. Um, so we are doing that. We, uh, as part of that, we recently all came to an agreement on how uh, dead combatants work, um, that you no longer have to um, die defensively and, and cover, uh, you still need to die defensively. We changed how that works. Um, when you die defensively, you no longer have to fall to the ground and cover yourself with a shield. Um, that's still an option, but that doesn't reflect the the reality that sometimes it's not the safest of options to fall on the ground if you're on a, a closed and tight place where people are pushing. Um, I know that I would not want to go down and have people trampling over me. Uh, so we aren't going to have that. We're trusting people to, to use some sense on this. Uh, so when you're, when you're dead, what we want is, um, you make some acknowledgement that you're dead, whether that's it, you always should call out good. Uh, and maybe that's in a situation where people are pressing, you call out good. You put your, your sword above your head and you try to walk out backwards. Um, what that doesn't mean is I'm dead and I walk through my enemy's lines or my foe's lines. You, that's interfering with the battle. You can't do that. Um, it could also mean things like maybe taking a knee. Um, there's just a, a lot of different options for how we see people could die defensively um, to make sure that they're they're safe. Um, okay. We also, we had the the rules in over the summer, but we put them in the, the handbook on heat and air quality rules. So if the uh, air is really bad, uh, I'm going to pull up here. We have a, a standard that we're looking at fire.airnow.gov that if the air is uh, over 200 on the air quality index, uh, all outdoor martial activities are to be canceled. Um, and then at lower levels, the marshal can can use their discretion, um, which is a, a good point to always say that a, a marshal, the, the group marshal can always use their discretion and say, hey, this isn't safe for us to practice. We can cancel. It doesn't have to be uh, this official view. If you I mean, we know this for it to be true. Like if you're at your fight practice and there's uh, bees everywhere, maybe you don't have fight practice in where there's a bunch of bees or some other kind of hazard. Um, we also put in uh, heat. Uh, we fought, we formalized putting in the heat requirements too, um, which were, uh, I want to make sure I'm saying this right. This was a, a few additions back. If the heat index reaches 103, 103 degrees or higher locally, all outdoor martial activities are to immediately cease for the day. Um, and we're asking you to use some some discretion on that too, that if you can go inside, that's fine. Uh, if it comes down, um, that might actually be the wording that we put in the, the final handbook too. Um, if you're at an event and you're having, it gets hot during the day and it cools off at, in the evening, you can absolutely have like a torchlight tournament when it's, when it's weather is returned down. We're asking people to use some, some sense on this. Um, what do we say? I want to pull up what we we fully said. Um, there's the air quality rules. Uh, 
if the heat index reaches 103 degrees or local or higher locally, all outdoor martial activities are to immediately cease until such time as the heat index has been below the cutoff for an hour. So if it's it's it reaches 103 and that's the peak of the day and it cools off and it's been below that for an hour, we can go ahead and and once again fight outdoors. Otherwise, you need to be fighting indoors. Um, so we put a little bit more rigor on that one. Uh, the society uh, had some clarifications around hand and elbow protection. Uh, the mid realm is still requiring hand and elbow protection behind all shields. So we we are tighter than the society on that one. Um, we added that uh, the use of mandrake style rubber thrusting tips is prohibited on all fiberglass spears. Uh, we added that spears over seven and a half feet in length shall not have a thrusting tip on both ends. Um, society went from uh, breaking out all the weapons and they kind of made a spear section now. We just want to make sure that it's explicit that uh, you can't have um, a nine foot spear with thrusting tips on both ends. Uh, I think everybody kind of understands that already. But we didn't see that quite in the the rules as we wanted to see it, so we put that in. We are allowing um, six foot fiberglass spears. So before those were something that you couldn't use in the mid realm. We're now saying that you can use a six foot fiberglass spear. Uh, you can't use um, a mandrake style uh, thrusting tip on a fiberglass spear, so you can't use it on a six foot one. Uh, we are also allowing foam heads and rattan clackers on weapons over six feet. Before we weren't allowing that. Uh, so up to seven and a half feet. Um, we changed the authorization requirements to become an MIT and warranted marshal. Uh, so it was kind of uh, a few additions back. We changed up how many authorizations we had. We went from six or seven authorizations for, for tournament fighting down to three. Um, and we didn't really, we thought about how to do the MIT process. And we were kind of like saying, okay, we'll let this um, kind of settle out for a bit. And then we'll we'll see where we're at. Um, and what we have come down to is, uh, before the requirement was you had to have three authorizations to, to be a marshal. Um, well, that's all we have now for tournament fighting. So to have, to require people to have all three seemed a little bit, uh, a little overboard, a little more than we needed. Um, so what we need to do, if you're, um, uh, if you're going to become an MIT, uh, or a warranted marshal, you need to have at least one authorization and you need to be authorized for at least six months. So we're, we're using a time constraint, which is similar to what the uh, target archery and thrown weapons people are doing. Um, we're trying to standardize that a little bit too. That uh, So we're kind of being consistent between all of the different areas. And that's something that we can waive on a case-by-case -case basis. That if, if you're starting up a new group uh, and you're new to the society and you get authorized and you want to have uh, a fight practice at your group, we will absolutely let somebody be an MIT so that they can have a local practice. Um, it's really just... Uh, the standard process is you're authorized for six months. We'll go ahead and make you become an MIT. Uh, and then for authorizations, um, what we're doing on that is we're still requiring two marshals, uh, but the one of them can be, um, if you're not authorized in a style, you can, you can watch the authorization, but the person who is the chief marshal for the authorization has to have the style. Um, we did this with good results with uh, for siege and for combat archery, uh, and it worked really well for that. Where um, we have areas of this kingdom where there aren't as many uh, marshals, and it was adding a little bit of an extra uh, burden to those groups. So, if you want to have an authorization, one the the person who is running the authorization needs to have that authorization. They need to have a second marshal, and that marshal does not necessarily need to have that authorization. It would be best if they do, but we're not requiring that. Uh, we already talked about the dead combatant. Uh, we talked a little bit about the inspection guidelines um, that we're trying to do as much visual inspections as we can uh, and giving uh, letting people know what's going to happen as we uh, we do that inspection. Um, anybody have any questions over the the new uh, role changes? Okay. So, Kellogg, uh, so if if there is a combat archery marshal, and I am the second marshal, that's okay to authorize someone in combat archery? Correct. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we, we're, we trust that our marshals have good sense uh, and can ask questions and, and do that. Um, as we know, I have a, a little bit of, I have uh, maybe more trust than other people, but I, I think it's be okay. We'll be all right. Um, we are also, I should mention here, we are doing a new experiment. We're trying out having um, 
two thrusting tips on a single-handed weapon. Previously, you could have either a, a butt spike or a thrusting tip, but not both on the same weapon. Um, and some of our kingdoms on more on the, the western edge of the kingdom uh, have places where they allow people to have both a butt spike and a, a thrusting tip. Um, and so we have people who weren't seeing or who would go out of kingdom and they face stuff that they, they wouldn't see here at home. Um, and so we decided to, to try this out. Uh, we were originally just going to put the change in. Uh, we got a lot of feedback saying, hey, we'd like to see, we're not sure about this. So we we backed off a little bit. We're going to do it as an experiment. Um, maybe it fails. Uh, maybe it'll do really well. Uh, or maybe nobody will use it. I don't know. Um, that's why we do experiments. Um, so for that, when you're having a, a thrusting tip on that, the people seem to be concerned about the, the butt spike more than anything. I think we all know how to do thrusting tips on the, the one end. Uh, when you're doing that, you have to have at least a half inch of rattan at the bottom of the weapon that doesn't have any, uh, any metal or anything like that. So if you have like a, if you have a, um, basket hilt that has a metal cup on the bottom, uh, you can't have a thrusting tip on that. You can't have uh metal and then a thrusting tip. That's just, that's just right out. We should all know that our, our rules say you can't have metal in the striking area. So you can't have metal and then put some foam over top of it and, and go beat up your friends. Um, so that's right out. I don't know why I should have to explicitly say that, but here we are. We're going to say that. Um, sometimes people will shave down their rattan to get it to fit onto their, their, um, through their basket hilt and a situation like that, you still need to have a half inch from like that bottom tang of your, your basket hilt. So you have to have a half inch above that. And if that doesn't gauge quite right, you can take, uh, you can, uh, tape some leather to the sides of it. We're allowed to have uh, leather on our, our striking surfaces. We use that. Um, to help hold some things together. So you can use uh, that to kind of pad out the sides and then put your, your foam on top of that. Um, that's how we're trying to, to go about that. And if you're in this experiment, uh, you need to email uh, Sir Drangi and the uh, Duke Eichgrander. Uh, Drangi is my deputy for, um, I'll get to you in a minute. Arm uh, Drangi is the deputy for armor combat. Eichgrander is the deputy for experiments. Uh, they'll get you on the list. You need to mark your weapons. And then we're going to have people reporting as they use the, the weapon to see how how it's using. Um, that's something that we've been doing with uh, on the Raker side with the reduced armor experiment, and it's, it seems to be working pretty well there. Uh, Edmund, you got your hand up. What do you got? So the, the area, the half inch of rattan below the tang and or basket hilt has to be built up so that it's, it's inch, an inch and a quarter whether by tape or extra leather or whatever. And the thrusting tip has to be inch and a quarter and a half inch thick, correct? Correct. Thank you. Yep. Uh, and that's something, one of the things that people have a lot of concerns about is we want to make sure people aren't basket hilting people. Um, and so that's something we're going to be uh, mindful of. Uh, so it's really going to be, I mean, we, you can't do an up, we're not doing uppercuts. We're not striking with things. So it's really, you have to place it here and then do a, a strike more like that. Um, and we'll see how that goes. Uh, if people, just like if I repeatedly hit people low or I hit people too hard, um, we can have sanctions and we can pull people's cards or they can be removed from the experiment. Uh, and we'll see how that goes. Um, so that's the, the experiment. Uh, I'm going to look over to see what uh, in the most recent summer changes we had, if there's anything that we need to include in here. Uh, nope, we had uh, dying defensively and air quality, which we already talked about. Uh, last winter we changed, um, we removed the part about turning or ducking your head to prevent a thrust proof part of the helmet. Before it was said that if you, if a shot's coming in, you turn your head, that was thought to be target substitution. Um, in other places in the handbook, it says the top and the side of the head are proof from thrust. So if your helmet is proof, uh, you should be able to, to trust that your, your proof piece of armor is okay to take a shot. Um, now it's to say like, if I take a shot like that, that might be dumb. You should probably not do that, but I'm not going to, we're not going to legislate people say how to, to block a shot. Um, we also changed, uh, shots from a two handed weapon that are thrown with one hand are to be treated as though they were thrown from the one handed version of that weapon. Uh, so this, uh, if I have a, a mass weapon, uh, and I throw that with one hand, uh, to the hip or the shoulder, that's a killing blow. Um, same if I have a two-handed, if I have a, if I have an ax and I hit you in the, the hip or the shoulder, it doesn't matter if that's one-handed or two-handed. That's a, a mass weapon. Uh, same with a, a mace. Uh, you can't have like a two-handed mace um, or a big one anyway. Uh, 
But where it comes into play mainly is if I have a two-handed sword and I throw uh, a two-handed sword shot and I hit you in the the hip, the hip or the shoulder, uh, that's a kill. I know I'm backwards. Hips, shoulders, knees, and toes. Um, but if I throw it, if I throw it with one hand, I'm now effectively using a, a one-handed sword, right? So it's how many. It's uh, just a little bit of clarity on, on what we mean by using a two-handed weapon. You have to use two-handed weapons with two hands. First, we're having it be a mass one. Um, we also have changed. Uh, we have we said that the authorization requirement for people who want to be a marshal can be waived if you were previously authorized. Uh, we have a we have some fighters who are no longer able to take the list. Um, it seems uh, kind of silly to say that they can't be marshals anymore. Uh, these are people who have a lot of a lot of information. They have a lot to give, uh, and we're going to continue to take advantage of whatever they want to give uh, as long as they they want to do it. Um, so we did that. We also streamlined the combat archery and siege MIT processes. Uh, classes are no longer required. Um, there used to be classes for each individual area to get the inspections. Uh, we are instead doing it, treating it more like a uh, an MIT for armored, where you have to go get signatures in different areas. Um, we also said that bow signatures can be collected from working on the archery range. Uh, so if you want to get inspection stickers for a bow, uh, you can go over to the combat, uh, to the target archery range. You'll probably see more bows there than you will at a, a normal SCA event. So it's it's good cross training. Um, we also have put in, and I don't know if anybody's taken up on this, uh, that if you're an armored marshal or target archery marshal, that you can get uh, an additional authorization for inspecting combat archery bows and gear without going through the full combat archery MIT process. Isabel, has anybody done that? Have you got anybody who's... No, I don't think so. Um, seems like a, just kind of a, a niche idea that uh, people didn't want to go for, and that's okay. Um, okay, so some... What, I think what does that look like, Kelly? What is what? Uh, that what do, that would look like if you were, uh, you'd go get. It's not much different than if you wanted to become a full combat archery marshal. But some people might not want to be out and uh, watching things. It's really that we would, um, we would cover the parts that you miss on on. So like if you were a target archery marshal already, uh, you already know how to to inspect bows. So we wouldn't expect you to to go through that whole process. Um. But we would want you to see like how to do the the weight test that you have to do for for uh, combat archery, um, and we'd also want to make sure that you know how to inspect the arrows. So it's just trying to cover the the gaps in that you would need to do to be an inspection marshal, uh, and then then you would just check gear and you wouldn't be out actually marshaling. So maybe some target archery people don't want to be on the field at all, but they might want to help with inspecting a gear. Yeah. Uh, yeah see, yeah, the co whole concept on this is that inspecting the bows and the ammo is the most time consuming part of, of uh, combat archery. And if we can get a few people who can just do that, it'll take the load off of the regular of the full marshals sure. and well, allow us to do the other stuff. Part of the reason that I asked kind of lends to my next question, and you, this might be on your agenda anyway, but I know there's been a lot of conversation around um, heavy inspections and maybe looking at some of those folks that maybe don't fight, but have been around for a really long time and have familiarity with how things should be or folks that run the list table being able to do inspections. Right. Is that's that something we've had a, a fair bit of conversation around and we're continuing to have conversations around um, to figure out what that training would look like and, and what we're comfortable with. Um, so that's not uh, so right now we aren't we don't really have that. We are looking to, to see about how to implement that okay. um, or if that's a, a good thing. Um, we've been trying to, to come up with some ideas and thoughts on how to, to approach that. Yeah, I know I have um, one or two folks in my group that are super interested in that, um, and and it continues to come up. So I wanted to throw the question out there. What I would, what you should, what I would have you do uh, is have those people email me. Um, okay. If uh, ha say, hey, I'm interested in doing that, and then that shows that we have um, some gen some genuine interest, uh, and that we can, I can use that to kind of. Um, I mean, they might help shape the policy and stuff like that. It's a lot easier to do something if we we know people who we can approach and kind of pre-check and, and see how we want to uh, go about doing that. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. 
Okay, uh, the last set of uh, big role changes, and then we're going to go into the the different areas. Uh, zoom bang is no longer considered as armor equivalent. It is still good for padding. So before you could use zoom bang for kidney protection, you may not use that for kidney protection. Uh, the people who I've seen uh, who have worn and gotten hit there have agreed that it's, it's probably not good for that. So that seems like a, a good rule. Um, unmodified hockey gloves may not be used as hand protection on a weapon. They are allowed behind a shield. So if I have just a hockey glove, I can't use that on a like a pole arm or a great weapon. I could use it behind my shield. Um, to modify it, you cover it in, in some thick leather to, to give it that to bump up the protection a little bit. Uh, weapons may no longer be covered in rawhide. Um, there are some places where people, it's not really prevalent in the mid realm, but there are some places where people were using those. And the reports I got were that people were breaking forearms. So uh, we are no longer have those. Um, lanyards may be waved on a single handed weapon during melee if it's safe to do so. So if you're fighting at a, a really big field, um, you don't, you may not, if the marshal okay with it, you don't have to have a lanyard on your single handed weapon. I think that really comes more into play. Like we, I don't see people uh, putting lanyards on when they draw out a backup weapon. Um, so I, it's just kind of keeping in line with that thing. Can't think. Uh, two handed weapons may have a handle area less than an inch and a quarter. So that's a, a handle area. So like if you have like a sword, that's not um, the whole length of your, your pull arm. You can't be like, well, this is my handle area. It goes all the way up to the blade that no, that's, that's not quite what we're talking about here. It's a, a limited section that you can, it might be a little bit thicker, uh, thinner, so you can better grip it with your, your gauntlets and hands. Um, we already talked about mandrake spear tips. Uh, we had a rule change where combat archers had to wear full hand protection, uh, and then we changed it back to only half gauntlets. I think everybody's familiar with that. Um, we are, the mid realm is no longer pay to play for people to be an authorized combatant. You can, uh, you can authorize and not be a member. Um, if you want to be a marshal or an MIT, you do need to be a member, though. Um, marshals uh, are officers. You Officers have to be members. If you're an MIT, you are training to be an officer, so you need to be a member. Um, and then all combatants are required to have a waiver on file with the clerk of the rosters to be considered to have a valid authorization. Uh, earlier this year, Isabel uh, helped with a big uh, validation of that and cleaning that up. So I think it, it's not really as big an issue anymore. Um, authorizations may occur at official practices or events. So uh, that's um, when we say official practices, like it's your group's normal practice that you you widely publish however you normally publish things. So that's not like uh, I'm going to go over to Edmund's house and he and I are going to authorize a, a handful of people that's in a private practice. Um, that doesn't work. Uh, it needs to be the the public thing that people could come to attend for your, your group. Um, waiver signed at practices should be submitted to the crook of the roster uh, quarterly. And uh, that's the big changes that we have there. Um, any questions on any of that? Okay, great. Um, the next thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go over the the different areas of the the handbook to kind of hit the high points. And if anybody has any questions, we'll, we'll cover them then. Um, so the mid realm, we currently have a total of five armored combat authorizations. We have three, what I call tournament styles and two um, melee only styles. So our, our authorizations are a single handed weapon, two handed weapon, pike, and then our melee only ones are combat archery and siege. Um, single handed weapon is any single handed weapon uh, with either another weapon or a shield. So you, um, for that, that would cover two weapons that covers uh, sword, shield, um, mace, buckler, axe, like single-handed axe. Um, two-handed weapon is any two-handed weapon other than a pike, which a pike is defined as a uh, thrust-only two-handed weapon. So that's like a nine-foot fiberglass spear is how we, we think of those. Um, both the two-handed weapon and the pike authorizations would allow you to use a six-foot spear. Um, we, we seem to like having six-foot spears tournaments in this kingdom. Uh, if you have either one of those authorizations, you can use a six-foot spear. Uh, and that kind of makes sense. We we inspect, we ex expect everybody to be able to show that they can thrust on all of their authorizations. So if you're using a, a pull arm, you have to show that you can thrust with that. And if you're using a six-foot pull arm, you're thrusting with that. Well, you could use a six-foot spear too. It's, I don't see really any difference with that. Um, and then pike is a thrust-only two-handed weapon. 
Uh, any form can be done at any, anybody who wants to come out, they can authorize whatever they want first. So if you want to come out and authorize with a uh, two-handed weapon first, that's okay. Um, if you want to come out and you want to authorize, if you want to use two weapons in your authorization and get the, the single-handed authorization, um, that's also okay. Uh, what we ask is for the initial authorization, you can do whatever form for the, the tournament ones. Uh, Combat Archery and Siege have their, their own process, but uh, we're going to do what we, for if it's your first authorization, we're going to do what we, we've we always done for an authorization. We're going to have a, a bout where you're calling out shots, where you're both standing, then somebody's on their knees, the other person's on their knees, and you're fighting one handed, and then you do a crown round. Um, so if, I, if it were me uh, and somebody came up and said, hey, I want to authorize Pike first. I might say that might you might not want to do that. Like that's going to do all this other stuff. It might not be the best idea for you. But if somebody really wants to do that, um, they can. That's all right. Uh, we want to see uh, an authorization for the initial authorization that people um, are able to throw shots safely, that they can uh, throw good thrusts and good shots, that they can block, that they know that they've been hit. Um, and author you have to include both uh, face and body thrusts. Uh, any questions on an initial authorization? Okay. Once you are already authorized, then you can have an advanced authorization. And that's what we've we've historically always done, where we are just having you spar and calling out shots. Um, when it comes to uh, a pike authorization, a, a what we usually think of as like a nine-foot spear authorization, that can be done in melee, uh, but it doesn't have to be. You can also have people dueling, so you can see how people are doing that. Um that way we're giving people some flexibility to, to handle how uh, authorizations are happening. Um, if you have a couple people at the same time, maybe you you do it in a, a melee situation so you can see how those work, how they're working, um, and that's okay. Um, but if you have just one person and it's a, a small event, we can we have the flexibility to, to have them do like a dueling authorization instead. Uh, and we'll see how that goes as well. Um, then combat archery and siege, uh, we expect uh, just a couple questions to to make sure that people know how to use their weapon and how to do that. Uh, there is a, a dual section where we're making sure you know how to fire your weapon. Uh, and then we do want to see a melee component of that to make sure that you know how to react when people are charging you, that you know the safe distances to fire, um, and that kind of thing too. Uh, anybody have any questions on any authorizations? Okay, great. Uh, next, we're going to talk about the, the rules of the list a little bit. Um, combatants assume the risk for any harm suffered by combat. So we're out here doing something uh, inherently uh, dangerous. We are, we're trying to hit each other with sticks. Um, we're all adults. It's okay for us to assume some risk. Uh, so that's what we're doing. Um, all combatants must be acceptable to the sovereign or the representative. So as marshals, marshals are uh, a representative of the crown. Uh, that also means that a territorial baron or baroness in their territory, they are explicitly a representative of the crown, uh, and they could tell you that um, you are not uh, suitable to be fighting. So a local baron or baroness in their in their lands can can do that as well. Uh, and then combatants must be authorized to fight at events. Um, the next one is the sovereign or the marshalette may bar any weapon or armor from use upon the field. Uh, so if you're a marshal and you don't like the look of something, you can bar it. I uh, got yeah, Edmund. So that that rule about you have to be authorized to fight at events, since all official SCA activities, including fight practices, are now defined as events, do we need to revisit the wording on that to make sure that people who aren't authorized are allowed to fight at fight practice? Is there a separate stipulation for a fight practice versus an event. Yeah, I think that, that was me using shorthand, not how the handbook is written. Um, okay. Uh, we understand that uh, when we say events, what we mean is our, our typical uh, weekend events or our, our week-long wars. Um, we don't mean, in this context, we don't mean your your local fight practice. Um, I mean, what, so so if, and, and I don't want to get too deep in the weeds here, but if, if somebody is is training to authorize and they want to try to authorize at Penzik, can they practice at Penzik before they go to their authorization? The uh, so there are some guide some guidance around that where I don't want somebody somebody can warm up uh, before they they come and do their authorization, uh, but they should not really be out there um, fighting for two or three days before they they do their authorization. So like it's a 
uh, I would say not enough time to really get training, but you can warm up before like a big uh, event to to get your authorization. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, the sovereign or martial may bar any weapon or armor from use upon the field. So if you don't like the look of somebody's weapon uh, and you can't quite pinpoint the, the rule that it breaks, but you're like, this doesn't look safe, uh, you can say, no, I'm sorry, you can't use this weapon. It, it's it's barred from this. Uh, and that is um, the person can say, well, I'm going to appeal that and they could appeal it to, you know, if you're just a marshal of the field, they could appeal it to the, the marshal of the event or the uh, the uh, group marshal, the regional marshal, the deputy for armor combat to me and ultimately to the crown. Um, I think that if you if everybody's telling you no repeatedly and you go all the way up to the crown, I, I feel bad about your your luck. Um, I think that might be a, a bad day, but um, I suppose if you really wanted, you could try in a society or a marshal was there, you could try to do that, too. I can't see that being being a, a good use of time, but people can do what they want to do. Um, so we have that. Uh, and with that said, too, if you are a, a marshal and you're harassing people, you're pulling people's stuff and you're you're doing that, um, you can have complaints filed on you and we'll look into that, too. So it's not uh, the marshal isn't um, if you if you're acting in your your best behavior and you're doing things right, we'll have your back. But if you are there harassing people or um, trying to have a power trip or, or keep somebody off the list because you just don't like them, uh, that's not acceptable. Um, we need to kind of have that balance there too. Um, combatants, we are expecting everybody to behave in a chivalrous manner. Uh, no one is or is required to participate in combat related activities. No one must accept a challenge, but turning fights are not a challenge. So um, I'm gonna keep picking on Edmund because he's the first one. He's in the upper left corner of my screen and he's a good buddy of mine. If I don't wanna fight Edmund at a, a tournament, uh, I don't have to fight him. I can be like, no, Edmund's too scary. And that's cool. I, I'm not required to fight him. That's me yielding that fight. Uh, now, out on the pickup field, he could be like, fight me. And I'd be like, no. And I can walk away and there's no no penalty there at all. Like, uh, that's just how it is. Um, no one may wear a real weapon on the field while fighting or while present during combat. So that means the marshals can't have a, a knife on their, their belt. Uh, the uh, a herald who... I should really probably not have a knife on them when they're coming out to, to her marshal. I don't want them, or not to marshal, to, to herald. I don't want to run the risk of a knife falling out of their, their pocket. Um, it's just best to not have a knife on the, the field. Uh, so that's the rules of the list. Any other questions over that section? Okay. Uh, next, we're going to talk about um, combat conventions. Uh, all weapons and armor must meet the society and mid-realm standards. All fighters are to be inspected before each event and practice. Uh, and that's really important. Um, you should have somebody check uh, your gear. Um, a marshal, one of our, our jobs there, we're not, um, as a marshal, we're not trying to find reasons to, to, to uh, hold people back from fighting. We're there to try to help them find ways to get on the field. But it's another set of eyes. Uh, I've had a case where I fight pretty often I'm, uh, and I travel around pretty often. My gear, I'm really hard on my gear. Uh, and I went up to a Gwentarian practice and had them, uh, as I should, I had them check my helmet and my barber was busted. So like they, they did me a solid. I, I wouldn't have noticed that myself, but a marshal is another set of eyes to look over your gear and, uh, they, we were able to get that taken care of. Like, a um, his highness actually welded my bar grill for me. So, uh, this was a, a while back. Um, but it's good to have another set of eyes to check your stuff. Uh, and oftentimes, um, as marshals, if somebody, if we find a way, if we, uh, say, hey, your your gear's not uh, doesn't pass. If possible, you should also try to find a way to help them get it up to to snuff so they can fight at the event. Um, so whenever possible, we want to to do that good customer service and and help people find a way to get onto the field instead of just telling them no, uh, get lost. Yeah, Edmund. How do you want us to handle people who just don't check in at the list table and are out there fighting? Haven't you know their buddy inspected them, but they didn't go through the you know, our formal check-in process and, and get inspected or checked by somebody who signed up as a marshal for the event. So, yes. Um, so there, there's a couple of different nuances there on that. Um, it's okay to, to be inspected. Uh, if you, if you, you need to be inspected by a marshal that has signed in. So we oftentimes, if a, a table gets busy, uh, you might have people who come up and just start helping marshal and they help uh, do inspections. 
Um, okay, I think Pelinor bounced. Uh, want to make sure we did have a question. So if if uh, all marshals should be signing in at the table, so we have a record of that. People should be signing in at the table. If somebody isn't signing in at the wave, uh, signing in, they're saying, "Hey, I'm signing this waiver." Um, that's a violation of the rules, and that should be brought to uh, the the marshal of the event's attention. That should be brought to the attention of the regional and to me as well, so we can keep uh, a record of that. Um, that's the kind of thing that can get the the SCA. Uh, and legal trouble if people aren't signing waivers. Um, so what we would handle in that situation, we would have a conversation with that that combatant, and, uh, maybe give them a warning the first time. And if it keeps coming up, that's something that we would pull your card for. If you aren't following the rules of the list, um, we will have some sort of sanction on that. Uh, yeah, Kimberly? Um, so uh, newly night marshal for my group, uh, I, somewhere along the way, I've developed an understanding that at practice um the minimum requirement is to inspect the helmet is that accurate or no should i be checking everyone's gear you should be checking everybody's gear uh, or uh, their entire gear yep is what i was getting at correct yeah should uh i mean an inspection doesn't have to be terribly long it doesn't need to be like a, a an ordeal of of minutes long but you should give them, I mean, we're trying to do quick visual inspections, uh, mm -hmm. you at least be checking how, seeing that they have all their gear um, and looking over the weapons and things like that too, to make yeah. sure that people are, are safe. Okay, cool. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, and then to, I want to make sure I got everything on Edmund's point. Uh, people need to sign at the list table. Um, it's okay to, to have, you don't need, not everybody needs to be signed up by the, or be inspected by the marshal in charge of the event. Um, when events get busy, people come up and help. Uh, we want to make sure that people are inspected, but the, they definitely need to be signing in at the table. Uh, they definitely need to be getting inspected. Um, uh, and that's just, that's just how it is. Um, yeah, I've, uh, uh, I've had words with some people about doing that. Um, and then the rule applies to everybody too. So uh, it applies to me, it applies to all knights, it applies to uh, royalty, it applies to unbelts. Um, it's the same role for everybody. Uh, okay. Uh, I think we all know this, that hold means to stop immediately. Uh, so no real argument there. Um, do not strike opponents on the ground and they are not permitted to throw shots. So if somebody's on the ground, don't hit them. If you're on the ground, don't throw shots. Um, I've seen that happen. Uh, we tell people not to do that, and hopefully they they don't make a habit of it. Um, if a combatant repeatedly makes themselves helpless, they can be deemed by the marshal to have been defeated. So if I'm if I'm fighting and a shot's coming in, and I repeatedly fall to the ground to avoid the shot, uh, you know, hey, I, I'm you might want to give them a warning, and then if they keep doing it, say, I'm sorry, you you are uh, in violation of this rule. Um, I don't know if I've ever seen that. Um, we that kind of touches on when. At some of the bigger tournaments, I've heard people say, you know, hey, we're going to give you a warning now. If we have a small list, don't back into the the ropes. If you do it uh, three times, we're going to put you on your knees. It's uh, kind of the same in vain of that. Uh, grappling, tripping, throwing, punching, kicking, wrestling are all prohibited. Uh, grappling um, is when we're, I am allowed to grab my opponent, the, the haft of my opponent's weapon or their keons, or I can touch their pommel. Uh, what we can't do is be fighting for control of of our weapons. So as soon as if I if I'm grabbing my opponent's weapon and they're grabbing mine and we're jostling back and forth, we're not fighting. We're we are we are wrestling for control of the weapons, uh, and that's no good. Uh, when it comes to grabbing your opponent's weapon, the way I think the best way to think of it is, I can grab and make one motion. So it's not grab and hold on and and go for a ride. It's grab, push, throw a shot. Um, uh, and I'm somebody who loves grappling. I love uh, that tussle, but uh, we are not to do that. Um, we talked about uh, that you may grab the the half of your opponent's weapon. Yeah, Edmund. I have a question. There was an interpretation at one point that, uh, say, I'm fighting with a strap shield. Right. And I've got a gauntlet or, or a hockey glove. And I'm able to grab the half of your pole arm while we're fighting. Right. That now my shield is no longer a shield, it is now a van brace. And if I get struck in it, I'm I have to count it that way. That was a an interpretation at one point. No, the, uh, is that so, 
Is I'm, that still the interpretation or are we going to be reasonable and not be silly about this? I mean, if I were a lawyer, I'd say you were leading the the uh, the judge there with the silly part. But no, um, it, it's definitely under, a little bit under the grappling. Uh, it, the rules state that a shield has to be controlled by your hand. Your shield is still being controlled by your hand. Um, so that's still a shield. Uh, and it's still going to fall under the grappling rule that I can grab my, uh, I feel like you're letting out the, the do cool secrets there on this one. Um, and it's going to go up on YouTube. So you're, you're letting the world know, uh, deep Duke secrets. Um, you can grab somebody's the, if you have a fully gauntleted hand, your hands protected, you could grab somebody's, uh, a pull arm. Um, and you have to do the same kind of thing. That's it's one motion. It's not grab and hold on. And, and now I have this secret thing. So. I think it's a of of limited use, but uh, if it comes up, yes, that's something that could be done. Um, what you can't do, uh, you uh, you may grab your own the blade of your own weapon. So if you're fighting with a a great weapon or a, a hand and a half sword, um, I can grab the blade and do some half sorting. Uh, I can't grab the my opponent's blade um, at all. Uh, and when you if you are doing half sorting, if I have my hand on the the blade. I can't hit with a section in between my hands. Uh, no um, high sticking. You can't. That's no kind of punching and, do, and doing that. Cross checking. Cross checking. Cross -checking. Okay. High yeah. sticking. Up. I got it. It's all. It's all high sticking in our game. Yeah, I guess it is. That's true. Uh, yeah. Um, don't cross check. Um, uh, our target area is in uh, the head, to an inch above the knee, excluding the hands and wrists. Um, an opponent may, or a combatant may not strike with a shield, but a shield may be placed against an opponent. So what that means is, um, if this is, if this is my shield and this is my opponent, I can place my shield, uh, right here. That's okay. I'm, I'm not allowed to strike them. Um, I don't have to give up my space. So if, if, if I start pushing in, I don't have to give up the space on that shield if your opponent's pushing in. Um, so that's, uh, maintaining your position. Um, and your opponent, it's it's uh, a fine point. Like uh, your opponent, they can they can hit themselves on your shield. That's okay. Um, again, we are adults, and if you want to hit yourself with my shield, I'm not going to stop you. Uh, I think that that's again kind of dumb, but uh, so be it. Um, what you are allowed to do is my shield. By definition, a shield is there to to be touching your opponent's weapon, right? So my shield is allowed to be on my opponent's weapon. Um, that's what it's there for. So you can have your shield. I can use my shield and and push my opponents. I can have it on their basket hill. I can have it on their on their blade um, to kind of to do a little bit of manipulation. I don't know how. Uh, I mean, that's what it's for. It's for blocking. So we can we can do that. Um, we already talked about shields being controlled by the hand. Uh, we talked about not striking your opponent. This is, uh, I think the most common place that I see this is if somebody is, is legged and their opponent comes in, sometimes people will get exuberant and they might hit their opponent with their shield. Um, that's a place to, to kind of be mindful of that. Uh, next up, we're going to talk about blow acknowledgement. The effectiveness of a blow is left to the honor of the combatant being struck. Um, so when Edmund hits me, it's up to me to say whether that was a good shot or not. Same if I hit him. Uh, shots to the face are lighter than to the rest of the body or head. So if this is a shot, it's not thrust. So if I take a sh uh, a shot to the head, um, to the face, it should be lighter than a shot to the body or to the head. Um, this is somewhere the I heard about this over the. What I've heard is that the mid realm takes harder to the face than than some kingdoms like Atlantia. That uh, and we really shouldn't the. The rules state it should be lighter to the face. We're supposed to be having like a, an open face helmet with maybe a light male drape. Uh, so you don't have to be hit particularly hard there. Um, we've uh, Next up, we talked a little bit about face thrusts are, are lighter. So face thrusts are positive force and body thrusts are harder. And then the, the top and sides of the head are proof from thrusts. Um, math weapon shot to the hip and shoulder are judged fatal. Uh, and then if a wounded limb blocks an otherwise acceptable blow, the blow should be counted as though the limb were not there. And what I mean by that um, is if I if I lose my arm and I throw my arm out to to block, um, then you, you'd need to take that shot. If I'm making a good faith effort to keep my arm out of the way, like I have it tucked behind my back and somebody strikes my my arm again, um, well, you hit my arm again. That's that's a that's not a killing shot. 
Um, same with if you hit somebody in the leg and you hit them in the leg again, they don't suffer an additional penalty before being hit in the leg uh, is how to kind of think about that. Um, and then a blow that strikes with sufficient force and proper orientation is good regardless of what it hits prior to the combatant. So if I throw a, a shot and my opponent blocks a little bit with their shield and it still comes in and it's still on blade and it still has good power, that is still a good shot. Um, now, uh, sometimes, uh, oftentimes a shield will take a lot off of it and that might be too, that might be light or maybe I hit and it makes it the shot go flat. Flat shots are, are never good. Um, so that would make be other reasons why they might not be uh, good. Um, any questions on blow, blow acknowledgement? Yeah, Gilbert. Um, yeah, something that I've been asked a couple times while watching tournaments and things is fighters with long surcoats or captains and blow lands on the captain. And from the spectator point of view, we see it hit the leg. I've had, I've seen fighters called by marshals to take the leg because the captain was hit hard enough to drive it in. That's a question I've had a couple of times is, is these long captains or coats that are, are absorbing blows. Sure. Uh, so that kind of comes into a little bit about the, the armor standard. So that's, uh, that's the next thing we're going to be talking about. So that kind of, it has an interplay with that. Um, you are expected to whatever you're wearing. You're supposed to be able to feel a shot as though it's from the the standard armor that we're wearing. Um, so if you are wearing a a long surcoat that billows out behind you, you need to be cognizant of that 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 might absorb some shots, and you might need to be willing to take a lighter shot as a result of that. Um, I I don't know that we're ever going to get to a a perfect place where that touches a little bit on um, marshals should whenever possible let the combatants. Uh, make the settle the fight themselves, um, but we can give some guidance and account on that. Like, uh, uh, in that situation, it might be, hey, these shots are coming in, and and they look like they're they look like they're coming in unimpeded, um, and you're not acknowledging them, uh, but you have a a baggy, uh, surcoat. Might that be absorbing it? Are you feeling anything? That could be the kind of conversation that we we should have. We should try to make the combatants aware of what's going on, um, and try to help, uh guide them to to making good decisions or being aware of what they're wearing okay uh so uh armor standard um uh, we know we have to cover the head the neck uh kidneys and short ribs elbows hands and knees uh and groin um we already talked about the groin a little bit so we're not going to talk about that anymore the helm the face guard should prevent a one inch dowel from entering uh uh, with the gorget, a camel that drapes to absorb the full force of the blow is acceptable. If you're doing that kind of drape, you need to make sure you have padding on the, the top of your neck as well. Uh, hand, uh, we require hand protection behind a shield. A uh, society minimum has some things about if you're far enough away from the edge that that's not required. Uh, we do require that here in the mid realm. Uh, and then arms and legs as well. Um, we're going to talk about inspections here in a, in a minute. Um, or we already talked about that a couple of times. I don't know that we need to get much more into that. Uh, weapon standards. The minimum diameter of a weapon is an inch and a quarter. Um, we are doing the uh, the next one I have on here are weapons 48 inches or less or greater than seven foot six. May either have a thrusting tip or a butt spike, but not both. We're doing an experiment to try to change that. Um, a thrusting tip must fully cover the shaft of the weapon they are attached to. So if you if you have gigantic rattan, uh, your your thrusting tip has to make sure it covers uh, the full um size of that that uh retain as well uh and then a single-handed weapon may not exceed five pounds um so if you have a really heavy weapon uh, i have a i keep a fish scale with my my marshaling kit um if somebody has a really heavy weapon we can we can uh check that out too and that's a thing that we should do um next up i want to talk about marshaling duties uh as a marshal um when we're out marshaling on the field we have three near equal priorities yeah edmund um, I just wanted to mention on your point about the the thrusting tip covering the uh, size of the rattan. Um, having inspected a lot at Crown, I've seen a lot of weapons where people are are not covering that that full edge of the, the full size of the rattan. And uh, I don't want to throw a particular vendor under the bus, but there is one that sells pre-cut thrusting tips that are inch and a quarter. 
but not all rattan is just inch and a quarter. And so we I've got a lot of exposed shoulders. Right. Um, and, and a lot of people who are not rounding over the end of their rattan. So it is a sharp edge and it's really easy to figure out. I mean, you just run your thumb down that the edge of that thrusting tip and it, it'll bottom out right on the rattan. Right. So that's something something that we need to watch out for. Yep. I, I fully agree with that. Uh, that's uh, one of the ones that I always check for, too. And that's it's something I see more commonly than than I would like. Um, OK. Uh, when we talk about marshalling, there are three near equal priorities, uh, safety, fair witness and showmanship. Uh, so safety, we're there to make sure that everybody is safe. Uh, fair witness um, as marshals. It's our job. One of our duties is to 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 pro provide fair witness where we need to be able to tell a, a combatant, hey, you hit with the half of that blade of, the, of your weapon. Your shot was flat. Uh, the thrusting tip was was high or the thrusting tip was right on the face. Um, and we need to be we need to be mindful that uh, armored combat is exciting and that we're there. It's a something that we want people to watch. It's a spectator sport. Um, so on that, when it comes to safety, one of the things I try to do is if I'm marshaling a list, as people come on the list, I'll give them a quick visual check. Uh, like I just look up down real quick to make sure that people have uh, all their gear on. Um, what I found is sometimes people will go and they'll take off their gorgets or they might take off their arm armor uh, in between rounds um, and they come back out and they forgot to put it on. So you can always, you can kind of catch them and stop and say, hey, 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 uh, go get your stuff on. Um, and we're also there to make sure that the, the audience is safe too, that they don't, the combatants aren't running into them. Uh, if you're a witness, um, I need to be able to tell them where shots landed that I, if, if somebody's hitting flat, we need to let them know. If somebody is hitting with the, the haft, uh, we need to let the people know. Um, and then showmanship, uh, we want to, a fair witness and showmanship, we kind of have to balance them too on that, that, uh, the example I always give is at crown tournament, if I wanted to, uh, make sure that we never missed a shot, uh, that we had a marshal from all the angles, I could line the, 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 fi the list there in the finals with, uh, 20 marshals. So there you're, we'll never miss a shot, but then people won't get to watch it. So we have to balance showmanship and fair witness so we can, we can do that. Um, when an injury occurs on the field, the primary concern is getting to and assisting the injured party. Number one, take care of the, the person, make sure that they're okay, get them the aid that they need. Uh, and then any serious incident, uh, if we, we we have, sadly, we had a, a death a few years back on the equestrian field, or if somebody is seriously injured, take care of the person first. Um, or if we have any contact with mundane authorities, report that to me uh, as soon as it's safe to do so. So take care of the person. Let us know. So take care of them, protect the person. And then once that's done, let us know that we so we can protect the SCA too. Um, next up, marshals should be an impartial witness. So if um, if uh, I'm at a tournament and one of my guys is is uh, fighting, I'm going to step out of marshaling that list. I don't need to to marshal that list. Wherever possible, we want to to be. I trust my marshals to be impartial, uh, but wherever possible, we want to be marsh. We want to be impartial in appearance as well as in fact. Um, so if, uh, what that means is if I'm at a, like a, a small event, if I'm the only marshal at that event, uh, that doesn't mean that my people can't fight. It means that this is how it is. We're going to, I'm going to trust my people to be impartial, but, or I'm going to trust my marshals to be impartial. But if, if we're at an event, um, and there's two marshals there and one of my people is fighting, I can step out and have them marshal. So we can try to have it be as impartial as possible. Um, anybody have any questions on any of that? Uh, and we did a good job of this at Crown. Um, if you, I don't, uh, we had teams and um, all my marshals were cycling out when people that they were affiliated with were on were on the, the field. Uh, they did a really good job of that. Um, when a blow is not good for a reason the combatants cannot see, the marshals must inform the, the combatants. So if you're, if you're a marshal and you see somebody throw a flat shot, you need to call a hold uh, and you need to let them know that that shot was flat. Like if somebody, if they took it, they don't need to take that shot. Um, that's uh, an important thing for us to do. Uh, wherever possible, marshals should allow combatants to resolve the bout themselves. Um, marshals arbitrating the outcome should be a last resort. So we we want to let combatants kind of do that. Um, and what that can look like is uh, if there's a natural pause, if, if people are fighting and it looks like they're missing some shots, if there's a natural pause, maybe the marshals will call a hold and bring the combatants in and help facilitate a conversation. And say, hey, what is going on here? Hey, you guys see what's going on here? Um, uh, are you okay? What's happened with this shot or what? Like, what's what's going on? Um, and hopefully give the 
the combatant uh an opportunity so if if uh uh, Edmund's been blasting me in the head and I haven't been taking them. I would trust that when we came in, Edmund would be like, Hey, uh, Kellick, what's up with those headshots? And then I might give my, my account of, I think they're coming off, but they're light or they're coming in. Or maybe I'll be like, Oh yeah. Uh, thank you for reminding me. I was thinking about how beautiful my wife is, uh, which is very true. She is super pretty, uh, very distracting. Um, but the, the marshals can give me that opportunity to do that. Uh, and then after that, um, when we have that, where people come in and they're having a conversation, we need to remember that there's people watching and as a marshal, we should announce, we should tell people what's going on. Uh, we do a good job of this at Crown. We do this a good job of this at some other tournaments too, where afterwards, if the people are coming in and talking, when they back out, the marshal can say, uh, after some consideration, uh, Kelly uh, was distracted by the beauty of his wife. The shot was good. He just missed it. Uh, Edmund's the victor. Um, so that would, uh, could be something that could happen or after the discussion, uh, the blow was was light or the blow hit a, a shield or a sword um so that we give the audience some some notice of what's going on uh and that really does it uh goes a long way to letting um people know like combatants can be super it, the fight can look um especially with high level fighters sometimes people might be be dodging or missing shots or shots might be close and the two combatants can both be completely okay with everything that's happening but the people who are watching be like, what? It's looking like they're hitting each other and they're they're blowing each other up. Um, by having a conversation and, and letting people do that we uh, and telling people what's going on, uh, we can help control the the tone of the fire, what people, how their impression is going to do. Um, and in this day and age where a lot of our fights end up on YouTube, it's great to have that feedback too. Let people know what's going on so you don't have um, Monday, morning, Monday morning quarterbacking. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, the last one on marshaling duties is a copy of the rules of the list should be available at the list table. And I interpret that to mean you can keep a copy of it on your phone and your phone can be, you can have it downloaded and you can have it over there. So you don't actually have to print out the, the physical book. Uh, the last section that I have here um, is on inspections. We already talked a little bit about, we want to try to do as much as a, of it as possible as a, a visual check. We need to be checking um, helmets off the head. So what I like to do is somebody brings up a helmet to me. Um, if they have it already on their head, I'm going to check it on their head first. I don't need to have people take it off. So I keep my order. Um, but we need to make sure we need to do the, the lean check to make sure the helmet's not going to bottom out on their face. So I would need to tell, um, say, I'm going to, I'm going to push on your helmet. Is that okay? Yes. Then you check that. Um, so we're checking that we're going to check the fit of it too. When we're checking for the, the neck coverage and things like that, it's, it's supposed to be with your head neutral. So you're looking forward. So this isn't a case of, okay, uh, you've looked this way. Now I want you to look up this way and turn your head. And now I see your neck. So you're, you're no good. Um, it's from a, a neutral perspective and you can call somebody out and say, Hey, it looks like you might want to check your gap here. Or have you changed the padding in your helmet? Um, things like that. Uh, and might call people out for that too, but it's not trying to find a reason to can't to fail somebody. It's, it's trying to make sure that they're, they're safe and, and kind of a standard. Um, so after that, we, if you had your helmet off, you take your helmet off and you give it to the person. We need to check the inside for the padding to make sure there's enough padding. Uh, make sure that the welds and rivets are are good. Um, and that's when I like to take my gauge and check the, the bar grill. Uh, I don't, uh, I think it's much nicer than trying to gauge somebody's helmet while it's on their head. Um, we don't need to have it rattling around. Uh, and then check as much of it as possible uh, with a visual inspection. See that they have elbows and kidneys. Um, if you do need to touch somebody, uh, tell them what you're going to do um, and go about it that way. Check weapons too. Uh, I'm trying to go over here make sure I didn't forget anything. Um, that is everything that I have on my list. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. I'm going to go ahead and... Oh, Edmund, you got a question? Sorry. I hate to be the bother, but... Um, so something came up, and this was on the rapier field, and uh, this was a very old rule or an old habit for the marshal in charge of an event to always have the closest um, emergency room information available handy. Um, I know we all have our phones and can Google stuff and and what have you, but um, you know, making sure that if you're the MIC, you know exactly where the nearest place to go. If somebody gets hurt, to send them to, at 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 you know, you should be have that resource available. Um, I see that as being a, a good thing to do. I don't know that I've ever thought about that. 
Uh, I think today we have nine one one, and we we'd call. Yeah, but if you know, if I get my hand broken, you don't need to call nine one one for that. But you need to know where to go. No, I it's, think it's a great idea. And that that used to be part of the rules because we didn't, you know, back in the day we didn't have phones in our in our in our pockets to to find, you know, our favorite hospital chain uh, handy. But it, it was just. It was just something worth mentioning is that you know, we, we need to make sure we can get somebody to a place to get medical care as quickly and as reasonably as possible. Yeah. Well, you hope nothing ever happens, but things happen. And so if you have it right there at your fingertips, boom, 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 you can take care of it. Yeah, that's probably uh, a good practice. I don't know that we're going to make a, a rule about that, um, but if you send something, we can maybe include that in a future edition. Um it's uh, something to consider and, and to point out. Um, anybody else have any questions? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.